couple of the things that, that come to mind recently when people start talking about Facebook or YouTube is all the challenges that um, either creators are having with advertising or content creators are having with reaching the audience. And there's been changes that continually happen uh, from just about every platform that are dictating not only what types of content are being made, but how you as the content creator get it out there or as a broadcaster make sure that you're reaching your audience. I have three wonderful guests, uh, one of which joins us last minute, um, that are, are here. I've got uh, Scott Lipsky down on the end uh, from the US Golf Association. I have uh, Ariel Vieira, a uh, video producer from Urbaness, and our last minute guest is uh, D uh, Damon Am Amendolora, I can know. Nice. Uh, David Amendolora of the DA Show on CBS Radio, also host of Nomad, Nomad Channel, uh, as you go to YouTube or Facebook Live. Uh, and I'm obliged to say, if you want to buy some jerky, use uh, uh, go to uh, fieldtripjerky.com and put in the code uh, Nomad on there, and you get a 25% discount. That's so, right. Yeah, I'm obliged to say that because he's a last minute guest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but gentlemen, uh, each of you has a, a from from sports to travel to food to uh, sports again as well. Um, each of you has a varying different audience that you're always trying to reach, and I'm curious of you know, what are some of the biggest challenges you have today when it comes to reaching the audience or engaging. Why don't we start at the end with Scott and we'll work our way down. Sure, so you know, the United States Golf Association is, is in an, an interesting space within the sports industry. So you know, everybody knows our premier uh, event, the US Open, which is, is played every year. And you know, Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, Ricky Fowler. It's one of 14 championships that we host. So we have the Open Championships and then we have our Amateur Championships, which is much more, uh, caters to much more of a niche audience. Uh, and so that's sort of a challenge for us. We have two channels. We have our US Open channels, which is, is all about that championship on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And then we have our, our Enterprise USGA channels, uh, which is about all of our championships plus a lot of our non-championship items. And you know, it, it's interesting that you're trying to strike the right balance. So we had a, a smaller non-televised championship last week. And we're posting content about that. And we're streaming live to an audience that has mostly opted in for the US Open, for rule, the rules of golf, for course care, for things that, that appeal to a much broader audience. And so we're really trying to strike the balance of, okay, we know that there's a small niche audience that really wants to watch this content, but it's a much smaller audience than, than what the reason people tune in for our content for the most part. But on the other hand, we also want to bring this product to a wider audience by utilizing our channels. So you know, we're trying to provide the highest quality content that we can at, at our smaller championships when it comes to live streaming, but we also don't want to drive away that mainstream audience that followed us in the first place. So we always, we, we see that as, as a challenge and really what it comes down to is what quality of product are we going to put out there? We can't have our full production crew out there at every championship. And you know, also, what's the volume that we're going to produce uh, during those championships? If you start putting out a Facebook Live broadcast every 20 minutes, uh, and it involves golfers that aren't necessarily the most prominent, you, you may get some people unfollowing you. You may get people muting you. And then when they would want to follow your content during the US Open and, and the rest of the year, they've already kind of walked away. So that's, that's a big challenge for us. And it's, it's something that is constantly evolving when we talk about our content strategy. How about Ariel? Uh, so I offer a very unique perspective because I'm currently a solo creator. I run a Facebook live show called Urbanist where I explore cities around the world via Facebook Live and show people the neighborhoods and landmarks and talk about the history of these places. Um, but I think the biggest challenge for me is, is the greatest strength of Facebook that I can distribute my content. And that puts a lot of power into my hands, which is great, and that's how I've gotten um, my huge audience, amassing five million views in the past year and a half. But I am not content with only tens of thousands of views per video. I want hundreds of thousands of views because I think live video is better when there's even more people watching. So I think um, the challenge is trying to find other creative ways of distributing my content because I usually rely on partnering up with much bigger, larger pages than myself. And the challenges that much larger pages than myself, the ones with millions of followers, also are not getting that many views and their audiences are not as engaged. So I think it's more of a challenge of everyone coordinating together 
to help everyone grow all along? It's a good problem to have when you're tens of thousands or not hundreds of thousands, if not millions. That's awesome that you're doing it that way. Um, for me, I work in sports radio for CBS Sports Radio. I host a, a morning show between 9 and noon Eastern time, which is syndicated across the country. But the thing is, as you might imagine, sports radio is becoming a bit of a dated concept because people don't have radios anymore. So I got into sports radio as a broadcaster when I graduated from Syracuse in 2001. People listen to radio. 17 years later, you know, people have Alexa or they have their phone. They might be in the car, but if you live in New York City and don't have a car, you actually literally probably don't have a radio. Most of my friends don't own radios anymore. So we have to be in content creation in a lot of unique ways. Um, instead of actually being a radio network, we have to be basically an audio content provider. Which leads me to my next project, which I think is primarily the reason why I'm here, which is my Nomad series on YouTube, which is me using um, my background as a sports broadcaster to go out to games and then bring that experience to people in a YouTube uh, show. So once a week I put out um, an episode, which is usually between seven and nine minutes or so, and it's a game that I've gone to um, or a place that I've gone to eat or experience around a game since I travel a lot for my, my job. And um, you know, to the point um, that both of our previous guests were talking about, you know, the whole idea now is trying to find a, a bigger, um, you know, kind of a bigger audience to funnel your vision through. And for me, it's trying to find those keywords or those experiences that people will latch onto. And that's a tough kind of, um, it's a tough problem to try to figure out because the algorithms move so much. People's interests are so different all the time that oftentimes you don't know what's going to work. And it's almost like, you know, you're kind of um, figuring out the game as the game is played. And so it's, I think it's creatively stimulating all the time. But sometimes I put out a video and I go, oh, this is definitely going to catch fire. And it doesn't. And sometimes I put out a video that I go, this, nobody's going to watch this. And it's my most watched video of the year. So, you know, I wish there were more answers to it, but it's almost like there is no playbook. There is no rule book. You kind of just have to figure out these hints and secrets along the way and then try to capitalize on them kind of as you guys were talking about. Well, then, if that's the case, I mean, if, if it's kind of a, you know, crapshoot, you know, in terms of what is going to be successful, how do you as a content creator Evaluate the success of your, your um, videos. Is it engagement by comments? Is it actual you know viewership? What what are the metrics by which you guys are, are evaluating the success of of the videos? So, as the point you said earlier about like it's a crapshoot whether a video is successful or not, that has happened to me too. I've made my most viral video got 1.5 million views, and it was supposed to be a preview video for an actual live video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think my biggest metric is to judge engagement overall. Okay. Like, what are the comments I'm getting overall? It could be throughout the week, it could be throughout the day, it could be throughout the month. Uh, but I think general engagement gives you a, a context of how people are connecting with, with my content, at least. And I think when people are really connecting it with it on a deeper level, there's a greater chance of having these viral hits because if someone watches that two minute video that I did of John Lennon, people are gonna be like, gonna share like crazy. And that increases the chances of virality. But it's something that you can't predict. But you can uh, cultivate that audience to the point that your chances get higher and higher. I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, not wanting to have passive engagement. You know, I think it's really easy to pick up a view on Facebook. Uh, I think we really like to see, especially during a live broadcast, people commenting and then people replying to comments. I think that's when you're really starting to see really true engagement and it's really something that, it's, it's a piece of content that's catching enough interest where you know, people are not only just commenting on the video, this is good, this is bad, I agree, I disagree, but it's really sparking conversation. And I think that sort of goes hand in hand uh, with where the Facebook algorithm is going, at least we think so this week. Obviously, it changes. It changes constantly. <laughs> um, I think longer term, you know, we've, we've especially with Facebook, you know, we look at the number of views, but then we like to dig into that a little bit, and we like to look at average view time. Uh, we like to see it, you know, if people, because I think a view on Facebook is three seconds. So when we're going live and we have a a 25 minute um, live broadcast, I mean, we want to make sure, especially once it goes into the VOD frame, once we're finished live 
that people are watching, but people have actually dug into the content. And I think beyond that, we're also looking at what our peak viewership was as well. We're, we're taking a look at, okay, throughout the 25 minutes that we were live, A, what was, what, what was the number of the most live viewers we had at one time, and how long were we able to sustain that? And I think that's, that's sort of where we go to say, okay, this content was good, and then we can see where our live viewers dropped off. And, and sometimes it's really easy to tell why, and sometimes it isn't. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, views really, it really is our baseline, and then we like to dig a little bit deeper than that. Yeah, those are really good points. I know we create a lot of uh, online content, digital content for my radio show. It's got a simulcast from a digital standpoint, so you can watch it every day on a smart device, anything that's connected to the internet. And so we clip out a lot of those uh, clips and then put them on YouTube and put, post them on Facebook. And what you try to do is hit, at least for me, the stories of the day that people will probably be searching on YouTube or searching on Facebook as it happens. So sports figures that just had a big game, uh, sports games that were just um, you know, interesting, stories that people are engaged in. But engagement is another big part of that. It's, it's finding you know, people that are commenting on things, people that are retweeting things when we embed them on Twitter. And then for my Nomad show, you know, one thing that's been an interesting lesson is it's a long play. You know, sometimes I'll put out a video and it'll be hot within the week because somebody's searching that game that I went to. They want to see highlights of that game or that game to the consciousness. But my most viewed video actually didn't take off for months. It just kind of sat there. And then eventually, I think from word of mouth, passing it along, hey, this is really cool. It was actually a story that I did about um, a barbecue joint in Houston as I was covering the Super Bowl. And just because the barbecue joint had become kind of this uh, local interest story, they started becoming popular there, and then that spread out, and then it became part of the recommended views of YouTube's algorithm, and then that's when it started to take off. But that didn't happen until probably three months after I posted it. So it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where you gotta be patient as well when you put out something. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it takes a while to hit. So, so some of that sounds like it, there's a little bit of a, a you know, play on what type of content is actually being fed. Whether, you know, one of my favorite videos that you have is, is your uh, discussion you have with our Garfunkel, right? And he's talking, I think the two of you are talking about the, the Simon and Garfunkel and stuff he said back in the past, and you've got him on record saying, you know, I, I, I don't care about that shit. Um, but, you know, does the type of content matter? I, I know, Ariel, for you, it's a little, uh, Different in terms of you know you're you're going to a city and providing history, but I, I'd say for for Scott and and for Damon, does it matter if you've got uh, Jordan Spieth uh, uh, hitting or or you're talking to maybe the general manager of uh, one of the clubs? Uh, does that content resonate more, or do you have to? Is it still kind of a, a crapshoot for what type of content is going to resonate for your audience? I've seen you. Yeah, star power obviously matters. I mean, like we said, you know, we had we had the uh, U.S. Women's Amateur Four Ball last week, which is, amateur golfers, great players, but not players you'll see on television that you know that are household names. Obviously, if we have a Jordan Spieth playing live, that's going to generate a lot more views, and people will stay a lot longer. But it, really, we've seen it in terms of what the actual theme of, of the programming is. So if there's live golf, whatever that may be, whether it's amateur or professional, you're more likely to see a sustained audience. Uh, when we have a, a talking head, even if it's, even if it's a post-round press conference with a Dustin Johnson or Jordan Spieth, sometimes that's, that's relatively average. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily move the needle as much as you'd think. Um, even though you do have a name, which which helps somewhat, but you know, whenever we see you know, a when it's live golf, and then something that can actually live within a Facebook news feed for several hours when it comes to Facebook. So when we have the first ball of a championship, that's something that people still care about three hours later. So we'll post the first ball of the U.S. Mid Amateur Championship, and that gets really good views, and that gets good concurrent views, and it can it can do well for several hours. Whereas on Facebook, if it's, hey, we're a live look at the fourth hole of this match and this player is one up, 30 minutes later, that doesn't really matter a whole lot. Uh, so for us, it's, it's really picking and choosing, you know, what, when it comes to Facebook, what item really has sustainability, uh, you know, what can last for a while, so if I see it in three or four hours, it's still of interest to me. So we've, we've sort of made some, some strategic decisions there that when it's something that has a shorter shelf life, you know, Twitter, Periscope is a much stronger place for that, whereas if it's something that's first ball, you know, an interview that might, you know, be of interest for, for some hours, that's something that goes on Facebook. How about you, Damon? Yes, yeah, star power name recognition is a big deal. 
um, because those are the things that people are searching. Mm -hmm. And you're always just trying to get in that Google search. You're trying to get in that Facebook search. You're trying to get into that YouTube search. The other thing, though, that's big is um, kind of the viral nature of what somebody says or what happens. So it could be a no-name player or coach, not no name because we probably wouldn't have on a no name, but somebody that you know was of lesser interest. But if he says something really interesting or she says something really interesting, we try to clip that out, post that, and see if that will um, catch. And sometimes that does. So it's it's really, you know, it's, it's kind of educated guesses. We kind of all have a sense of that would probably be interesting. That person said something that was interesting. That looks interesting. That will probably catch. And then you're kind of crossing your fingers that your instincts are right and what you've studied before is right and what has happened in the past is right. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're not. But you kind of, the longer you do it, the more experience you have with it, the more you go, okay, this has worked before. So maybe we try to put this out again and maybe it'll work again. And I can partly speak to that because I don't depend too much on star power yet, but I do depend on brand power. And I've like collaborated, I've focused on collaborating with these organizations that have pre-built audiences in order for me to get from their audience. So I've collaborated with people like Central Park or the Brooklyn Museum or Lincoln Center. And the great part of actually doing a live video with them is that similar to Star Power, you get access to their audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best part about Facebook, specifically the platform, is that you can easily collaborate with other pages. It could be a, either a star, a sports star, or it could be a brand or organization. Well, it, it also helps. Yesterday, you know, Facebook announced uh, that the cross-posting is going to be available for everyone. So if you're collaborating with a brand, you can always cross-post on the brand's page, as well as you know, for USGA, if you have access to USGA Golfers page, you post on their individual pages. And now you've got multiple audiences, you know, as many, I think they said up to 90 or so pages that you could cross-post at a, at a given time, which exponentially increases your potential reach, right? But I think part of reaching, even if you're cross-posting, is still the algorithms are changing and stuff might get hidden within the, the news feed or, so, so I guess one question I have is how do you, what are your workarounds to, to make sure that your audience sees it or that the extended audience sees it if you're working with another brand, if you're working with a, an advertiser, if you're working with um, a, a location or, or a golf club or, or anywhere, like how, how do you, because not everybody has access to their own Facebook team or, or YouTube team. Not everybody has access to their own advertising budget today. But what are some of the work, workarounds? So I completely focus on workarounds because almost my entire reach is organic. <laughs> and I don't have a budget to have ads. Not yet. Um, so the workarounds I've done is coordinated with major pages to share my content. And that's major pages who enjoy my content or adds value to their audience as well. So I've collaborated with Alice Obscura, New York.com, and many others to share my videos while I'm live. So I get direct access to their audience. And then the other workaround is the simplest thing, is saying, hey, if you like this video, share it with your friends and family if you want to show them the beauty of New York City. Saying that one little sentence gets people to share. And sharing gets access to their audiences. Mm -hmm. And it kind of ends up being a, a tumbling effect uh, where you can get more and more access depending on how engaged their own friend circles are. And if you go to certain countries, people tend to be a whole lot more engaged. I haven't been yet to the Philippines or Thailand, but I imagine once I go to those countries, it could be a spiraling effect because people there are really highly engaged on Facebook. So that's, that's interesting and, and a great workaround to say share because I know Facebook hates it now if you put that in their copy, <laughs> share, they're just going to kick you all the way down the bottom of, uh, of the line. So, Luckily I mean, they can't read the, the video right, yet. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's coming probably, yeah. Um, no, I, you know, we, we certainly, it's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation for us because you know, we're, we're trying to find ways with everything that we post live or VOD or even if it's not video you know, to basically try and get that conversation going, to ask a question within the copy, you know, to try and to try and put something out there that is intriguing enough and maybe it's not even the most likable thing, but it's something people are going to respond to. You know, the rules of golf for us, a very, you know, a, a very enigmatic topic. Some people 
agree with a lot of it. A lot of people have opinions that are not so positive. But you know, if we post something, we have a show called Rules Live every month, and people are going to comment, and they're going to tell us whether they agree or disagree with what we're talking about. Or, you know, I like the new rules that are coming out, I don't. Um, that gets people talking, and you know, we, we really want to keep that conversation going. So, I mean, that's a work, I guess a workaround for us. It's, it's just a tactic that we're utilizing right now to make sure that people are, are talking about our content and not necessarily just trying to get them to like it or to click on a link. We are also very fortunate to have the, the ability to do some paid, um, so some paid social, and especially when it comes to our live shows and when it comes to some of our VOD uh, video series that we have. You know, we'll, we'll put some money behind that with our partners. You know, as Facebook has, has said numerous times, with this change in the algorithm, paid is not really going to be impacted. So we're able to, to reach the audience that we want to reach. If we feel like it's a significant enough piece of content, we do, we do put some budget behind that. But it, it's true, you know, I, I wish I had a, an answer as far as what workarounds are we using that work all the time with organic. And it, 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 we have noticed in the last three or four months that it has been, it has been challenging to get the reach that we want. I think our biggest workaround is keywords because we, you know, my, my format is so about the news of the day. Mm -hmm. We talk about the sports topics of the day. Um, and then for my, my online show, um, Nomad, I'm trying to capture what is interesting, you know, as soon as possible. That just, we're constantly working on, okay, what works well? Do we ask questions in the title? Um, you know, how do we just kind of ride the wave of what people are searching that day mm -hmm. or what people are searching that week. And it's a never ending kind of puzzle to try to put together, but keywords are so important, especially you know when you're creating YouTube videos in the descriptions and then your tag words that people would end up you know searching when they go there. And uh, just trying to consistently drill down the, to how people, how people ask questions online how they respond to questions online, what they're looking for online, and just trying to like pick that out and put it into what your content is. Is there any boosting that happens after, after the fact? Because, you know, for example, you mentioned the Houston barbecue joint, and uh, say you know, uh, the Rockets had won, and, and Houston as a city is going to be big in uh, search uh, right now, or, or you know, whatever happens. Um, can they? Do you do any boosting after the fact to say, hey, I'm, I, I've got this whole thing about Houston, people are going to be searching about it and I'm, I'm going to advertise it, or likewise any of the other events or something that's happening in the news to bring up past articles or past episodes to say, like, hey, this is something that I could advertise or boost or, or at least, hey, remember this and share again so it become, comes back up to the top of the feed? Yeah, I haven't done the sponsored post that way, but I have reposted things to my timeline on Twitter mm -hmm. or on Facebook, um, reminded people, hey, we did this a couple of months ago, or we talked about this, or check this out, when yes, it's in the news again. You know, that happens a lot when things that you do, like I, I graduated from Syracuse, and there's uh, an old pizza joint, wings joint up there that's been there for 80 years called The Varsity, that was just under, uh, there was a, a Concerned that it was going to go under, that it was going to get bought out to be, mm -hmm. you know, bought up by a, a condo complex. And so, this being in the news, I reposted saying, "Hey, I did this show on the Varsity. Go check it out." Um, luckily, the Varsity is going to survive. But knowing that people are talking about it, then yeah, reposting it I think is probably usually a smart idea. I've done yeah. the same thing where I've, um, I've, for this past month of April, I've been reposting every day at 6 a.m. Uh, my old episodes, and it has done amazing things. I've gotten netted around like 30,000 views for reruns alone per week. And a lot of my audience is saying like, whoa, I never knew you made such episode on so-and-so. I'm so glad you're sharing it. And now they're tuning in actively 6 a.m. in the morning every day to see those reruns. Uh, so it kind of works similar to what TV does. Um, and in terms of boosting, I have a different perspective since I do very little boosting. The little boosting I do is to boost to brands and tourism boards I want to work with. Uh, so if I have a great episode, I boost that to say, it could be like the tourism board of Paris. And I try to target them so they'll see my stuff and increase the chances of them, of working with them. Sure, yeah, I can, I can parrot a lot, of, a lot of what was just said. You know, we have, we have a series called USGA Golf Journal. Um, we come out with 
two or three episodes a month. And you know, the topics uh, range from you know, talking, um, catching up with Lee Trevino you know, to our, our current USGA champions to things that are totally unrelated to our championship content. Uh, so for instance, we just unveiled the uh, US Senior Women's Open trophy. That was an episode. And that's going to be in Chicago, that championship in July. So that's something that will definitely resurface probably with some budget behind it as we get closer to the championship as we're trying to, to you know, meet some of our other goals organizationally when it comes to ticket sales and such. Um, Ian Happ, uh, player, plays for the Chicago Cubs, a uh, great golfer. His father was actually a USGA agronomist uh, for years. We did an episode with him. Uh, so you know, one of those things where if, if he, uh, he has a big week, it's definitely something will surface again. We happen to run it. Uh, I, we got very lucky. We ran it on opening day, and he hit a home run the first pitch of the 2018 Major League Baseball season. So that did really well for us. And um, you know, if he if he has a hot week, or if he makes the All Star team, or something like that, it, it's really easy for us to resurface. And and actually, Ariel, it's funny. You said you posted uh, you post a lot of things at 6 a.m. You know, we we've sort of taken to reposting our our golf journal episodes or some other you know, documentary style content at three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Uh, we'll do that on Twitter. It's you sort of like you would turn on TV at three in the morning and you and you watch something second run. It's, it's amazing the views that, that we'll get. We'll wake up, we'll, we'll go to the office, we'll see at 8.30 a.m. Because of the you know what you missed, what you may have missed um, feature on Twitter, we'll get several, several thousand views at four o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and a really, really great way to extend the life of your content. Are, do you know, um, just tagging on that real quick, mm -hmm. for, for the what you may have missed, because I, yeah. I see that on Twitter, um, Facebook used to have something like that, uh, and I think they might yeah. might still in, in some mobile format. Um, but do you do most of those views happen within region, or do those happen abroad? Do, do you have the metrics on? Uh, we haven't, you know what, it's, it's something we haven't dug into as much. I know that we will post content sometimes in the middle of the night, we just did it yesterday, if it is something that is, is more appealing to a different part of the country. We had, our, we had a qualifier for the U.S. Women's Open in Japan, and we actually posted you know, a photo of that with the results last night at 3 a.m. So we definitely, we definitely look to do that. Um, whether or not it has that big of an impact and whether people overseas are watching and viewing uh, during that time of the evening, um, I, I don't think we've, we've really gone as deep as we should on that. But I, I think it's fair to say that it does have some impact. Um, one thing I've noticed with Facebook is that they roll out posts throughout the day if it's mm -hmm. not live. So if you're resharing something, you can, I can reshare at 6 a.m. That uh, person across the world might see it later on at 9 p.m. Right. And it tends to happen just because of what the Facebook algorithm is doing. Right, and they've, they've got the in the news section versus the most recent. So it's like whichever selection on that news feed, you know, uh, or, or, or popular posts, like they, they'll automatically boost something that's popular within your yeah. network of friends and, and likes. And, and, uh, and from the end user's perspective, they have no idea that you reposted it hours ago. Uh, sometimes I get uh, comments of a photo I took during the daytime right. and someone is posting like, oh my god, New York City's still daytime at 10 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I took that yeah. hours ago. Uh, and it's because Facebook just does, in the platform, they don't differentiate between those right. different posts. And they'll also do that if you comment on something that you did you know, eight hours ago yeah. and you comment it on now, right. now everybody's going to see that back at the top of the news feed because that's something new right. that happened. So that's one major workaround I do to increase the reach of my post. I respond to every single comment. Regardless of whether I responded in live video, I respond again written down. And the reason for that is every single comment you do, reply, increases the reach just a little bit. You literally see it increase. And if you do that at scale, which I managed to do in a few hours, I respond to maybe two or 300 comments, uh, it could go a very long way. Wow. And is that, is that reach sort of within, so you replied to somebody in, in Tulsa, are they, are they, is that reach sort of increasing in that particular area? <laughs> I don't have any data on that. Interesting. Um, but that is, would be something interesting to look into. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So um, one thing that we talk, you've talked about a bit is collaboration. And I'm curious, is there an amount of collaboration, pre-planned collaboration in, uh, we've talked about coordinated sharing, we've talked about the brands, but in terms of um, how, do you, how do you get the audience, how do you get the advertiser, how do you get the um, type of, of um, fandom, um, how, do you, how do you try to attract those uh, for the content that you're creating in order to, to maximize that reach? Sure, so uh, Rules Live is a great example for us. You know, we have a, a Rolex Rules Question of the Week that we put out each week uh, on Twitter and Facebook. 
and we use those questions, those poll questions, to draw people into the Rules Live episode. We'll say, hey, option A, option B, or option C, and uh, we'll talk about your responses on Rules Live. So that's, that's been a really, really strong way for us to do that. Um, so you know, just when it comes to previewing content uh, and telling people, hey, we're going to be live tomorrow, uh, on, you know, on, at 12.30 p.m. I think we also want to get people to engage beforehand so people sort of has a, have a vested interest in coming back mm -hmm. when we're actually live. Another thing that we've, um, well, we've started to utilize, obviously you can, you can schedule a live broadcast, and so we'll say, hey, 1 p.m. we're going to have rules live. Mm -hmm. um, on Facebook and people will get those notifications. They'll get, as soon as you post it, they'll get a 20 minute warning when you're about to go live and then obviously when you go live, they get it again. So, Especially if they subscribe to the notification yeah, for it, Yeah, if they're right? subscribing to notifications, yeah. So that's really nice when, when, you, when you schedule ahead of time. It gives people, not only do people see it within their news feed, but people that have subscribed to your notifications, they have a heads up rather than just being hit with, hey, they're now live and you know, it, may, it may not be something they can get to right away. So that's been, that's been a big help for us as well. I, I've gotten mostly my fandom because I'm the face of all my content. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I, I can't do that with this face. <laughs> so they, they just like, like following me for various reasons. It could be a bunch of different reasons. They might like the history, the stories I tell. They might uh, like my humor. They might like um, just listening to my voice. Some, some people say they don't even watch the video. They li just listen to it like if it were a podcast. Uh, but how do I engage a fandom of some other company I'm collaborating with? So. If I'm collaborating with a major media brand like Atlas Obscura, I tailor that video to engage Atlas Obscura's audience. So for me, I talk about history in a general perspective, more about travel mm -hmm. and cities. But if at Atlas Obscura, they cover more about like dark things and macabre and weird stuff. So I just do a Central Park tour and talk about the dark secrets of Central Park. And that's how I engage their audience because that their audience already wants that, and they then they learn about me, and it just goes into that middle of the Venn diagram where everyone's happy. Yeah, yeah I think for us, uh, fit is really important because if we have a sponsor that doesn't really fit the audience, it doesn't really ever get effective. Right. So you've got to figure out an aud you've got to figure out a brand that works with the people that you know are watching, and really hitting that what we call P one demographic. P1 to the ones that are there with you every single day. Mm -hmm. Making sure those people are served by your brand and so then naturally when you talk about them it makes sense. You know we have um, on my sports radio show every time Burger King puts out a new crazy sandwich they come on the show. They want us to try it. <laughs> Guess what? That hits our target demographic pretty good. Sports fans that want to eat crazy weird hamburgers. Um, you know this week um, we are promoting um, a, a berry company to send berries for Mother's Day. We have it on Valentine's Day the week before and Mother's Day the week before. Guess what? A lot of men are listening. They go, oh yeah, crap, it's Mother's Day. I got to get <laughs> something. Um, or it's, uh, you know, Valentine's Day. Let me get something. And that's our read. Our that read is, me. it's coming up. Mother's Day's coming up. This is an easy way to get a fix. Yeah, that reminds me. I've, I've been on the road for three weeks. I need to get my wife something. Yeah. <laughs> so those fits are obvious. And um, I think also consistency, like you guys are talking about, is so important as well. Making sure the audience knows when to expect what you're going to deliver. And yeah. those schedules are really important because on Tuesdays we do something different than we do on Fridays. The longer you do that, the more the audience expects, okay, this is what's coming in and then I can engage because I know it's supposed to happen. So, so actually scheduling is an interesting thing because you know, they, they, Facebook talked about frame accurate start times and actually the, the amount of time that you have on you know, a slate, something that's running and trying to build the audience before you go live, is that something that's, that's necessary or do you try to capitalize on the audience right away? We've, we've promoted that we're going to go live at, at um, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We've put out the notifications. Facebook's put out the notifications. So I'm hoping that my audience is there. Or are you still waiting a little bit for that audience to build before you go live in, into the story, into the, the live shot, or into uh, whatever you're covering? So I actually do in a very counterintuitive approach. Everyone wants the huge, like, Surprise! And everybody is like, "Hey guys!" I don't do that. <laughs> I actually put a very beautiful frame of a cityscape. Okay. Uh, or if I'm doing an indoor place like a museum, I show like a beautiful painting and just leave the frame there for about two or three minutes, so people can kind of 
it sets the scene and also people feel hyped up for what's going to happen. It, it leads to anticipation, even though nothing is happening. And it's great because it gives me the opportunity also on the side to share to various pages and groups on my secondary phone. So it works both ways. True. If we don't have the ability to say, hey, this episode is coming up tomorrow, this episode is coming up in two hours, you know, we'll do something where if we have the full production crew available, we'll, we'll go live um, if we're at the US Open, for instance, and we'll have a countdown clock. So we'll just show no announcers, nobody talking. We'll just show a shot of the driving range, for instance, and players hitting and, and putting. And it'll just be counting down you know, from one minute. And so people know, or, or we'll go up two or three minutes ahead of time you know, to build an audience, to let people know, hey, you know, this is not just a, a slate that says we'll be back shortly. People know what they're watching. They know what they're going to get. If we can, we'll have sort of on the left side, you know, sort of like you would see on a part in the interruption here, the two or three things we're going to talk about. And uh, people know when it's coming, and, and uh, it allows us to build an audience and sustain that. But to your audience, it's also live golf, right? It's, it's the driving range, but it's still live golf. Correct. And, that's, and, and what I just referred to is it's, um, that's generally when we're going to do like a live from sort of a deal. If it's live golf and, and hey, we have uh, Tiger Woods out on the 10th hole, we're, we're just going live. It's one of those deals where, you know, especially when we're at a smaller championship and we don't have a full crew, it's when our producer can get out there and can go live. And, you know, if we try and, try and wait an extra five or six minutes, we might miss something. So, you know, if it's especially, if, it, if it's Periscope, if someone's out there and, hey, these two groups are here, and they're hitting their approach shots, we're going to go live and, and we'll try and just talk it up a little bit as the players are walking to the green, give people some background information. So maybe given, especially with Periscope, we're generally using an iPhone. So the, the picture quality is not what you would see with a full production quality crew. We're giving background information. People understand that action is going to happen, even if we have a minute or two in which you can't see the players yet. So it's really important for us to keep people engaged rather than have people walk away, especially when we don't have that full, that full experience that we can provide. Yeah, I like the idea of uh, building suspense with both the countdown clock and you just holding that shot. Because, you know, that's kind of why that element of danger, that element of what's going to happen, the element of suspense is what keeps people coming back for so many different things. It's, it's live television, it's live radio, it's live internet content, whatever that is, that you don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to start brings people in because things that, are, that feel canned or um, totally produced front to center don't have the same kind of edge to them. So I think those are really great ideas to, to help create content. So one, uh, one final question I'm, I have, you know, I'm going to open it up for some additional questions for everybody else, is does the, the quality of the content matter? Meaning does shooting on a phone, shooting on an Osmo, shooting on a 4K camera, having a full production uh, rig, does that matter for, you've got video on demand content that's going up to, to YouTube, to live content, like does that quality matter for getting your audience? I, I think it, it, it matters, but I think it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that top production quality if people sort of understand what they're going to get on a specific channel. So. We're really trying to carve out a niche where when you go to Facebook Live, you're going to see you know, our full, we're going to take a big swing at it. We're going to have graphics. We're going to have two cameras. We're going to have full production crew. If you're following us on Twitter and Periscope and we're doing a live hit um, at an amateur championship, it's, you're probably going to see an iPhone. But that's OK because it's more of an authentic experience. And that's what we're showing people consistently um, on Twitter. If we're going live on Instagram, you're probably not going to see live golf, but you're going to see us walking the range and talking to um, you know, players maybe using our iPhone or using a GoPro. So I think as long as the audience sort of knows what to expect and they know that, hey, if I'm on Facebook Live, I'm, I'm getting a fully produced piece of content or I'm, I'm going to get an Osmo every time. I think that's what really leads to consistency. I think if you're inconsistent, we've used that word a lot here, I'm going to have the fully, the fully produced we're going to have the fully produced broadcast, and then an hour later, we're going to go live on the same channel with an iPhone. I think that's when you start to create sort of doubt with the content that you're producing. Mm -hmm. uh, due to the nature of my content, which is urban exploration, um, generally the best thing to use is the phone, because the phone is super portable. portable. I can take it anywhere. And also, I can see the comments right where the lens is, so I can establish, in, in essence, eye contact with my viewers. But the most important piece of hardware, and it's the simplest thing, is a gimbal stabilizer. If I have steady footage for two hour walking tours, 
uh, people are hooked because if you have that shakiness, people are like, oh, this is kind of amateurish. But you just upgrade to a $200 piece of gear and suddenly people think this is the next travel <laughs> channel. Um, and it makes a huge difference. But now recently I've been, oh sorry, I've been expanding to 360 video and also to uh, HD broadcasts using a DSLR. And I'm, try, I'm thinking of different, different stories to tell utilizing that type of gear. Not to up the quality, but to tell a different story. I think um, quality of the technology is important for your brand. It doesn't necessarily equate to more views. If you want to build a brand that looks professional, that looks like a television show, that looks like a, a, a golf broadcast and a high quality, then technology is important because you want that to be a reputation. Mm -hmm. But you'll see videos on YouTube that go viral that are just somebody holding a phone and it's vertical and you, know, you can't even really hear it, but just whatever is visually captivating explodes versus something that looks like a produced piece of content that you know, only does a few views. So it's, you wish that, I guess it's, it happens both ways. Sometimes you wish if I invest the technology, I know the views will go up, but it's not necessarily true. But then that also for, um, you know, for Ariel and I, it helps because that means you can kind of be rogue outside of a television production. Yeah. And it evens the playing field because you know that ne not necessarily the technology level is gonna be what's captivating. It can be where your content is that's captivating. And I, to, to add to that, the, I think it, the most important thing of anything is story. Mm -hmm. You're telling a good story, even in sports, even in any other type of industry, it can even be tech, in education. If you're telling a good story from it, you get people hooked, regardless. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's all of my questions that I had here on the page. And I know there's probably a couple sitting here in the room. Um, Okay. Um, I have a question about uh, the use of countdown clocks for their Facebook lives. Um, so I work with Circa, we're an online digital world. We do news target, but online you know, nationally. Um, we've dabbled in using countdown clocks with various things that we've done. We found that it really affects our uh, on-demand playback of our videos. Does that matter to you? Is that Are you more focused on your, your live engagement or your engagement after? I mean, we've, we've made a pretty big effort to make sure that when we're live, that if we're producing a live broadcast, the importance to us is how are we engaging people when we're live. You know, I, I, what we've noticed with live, to use Facebook Live as an example, you know, views are a great way to pad the stats afterwards because, you know, it'll, Facebook will serve your video for hours on end after, afterwards, but you're right, we'll see the average view time drop significantly. So, yes, I, I definitely agree that it does have that sort of impact. Um, it, we're not as concerned with that because we really want to keep people engaged while we're live if it's a live broadcast, to, just to, to, to keep it short. I 100% agree with you, Scott. I don't use countdown, clock, countdown clocks, but um, when it comes to doing the live video, it's all about that live interaction mm -hmm. for me. If, uh, to, the, sense I, the way I think about it is if you're not going to interact with the audience or not going to do something that's supposed to be live, then just post a regular video. Uh, there's no point in making it live. Yeah, I think the only point, the best utilization of live video is either audience interaction or showing something that in essence you have to join in there to be live with the thing or the place. It, one thing uh, to add on to that is if you end up clipping the countdown clock at the very beginning and in order to have kind of a frame accurate start or something that looks like, hey, we're live now, yeah. If you do that after the fact and you have to repost it, you end up losing all of the yeah, comments and engagements yeah. and everything yeah. that happens in the show. So, so that's one thing, and especially if you're saving it locally, mm -hmm. if you upload it, people won't be able to see those as they would have happened in the Facebook Live interface. So you end up having like a trade-off. Do I want to keep the engagement and boost that through natural uh, viewership, or do I want to have something that's polished and clean and, and at the end of it, you know, people are coming in on the video on demand asset. So you do end up having a, a bit yeah. of a trade-off. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, uh, maybe some people aren't aware of accelerated posts. 
mm -hmm. like accelerated boosting, and I know that's something that you utilize in mm -hmm. USGA. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of wanted you to talk through uh, why you guys may choose to sure. accelerated boost versus a traditional boost, mm -hmm. and when maybe it's better to boost or post an ad, yeah. which sure. are also different. Right. Yeah, so I think it kind of goes back to, to our first question. You know, when we're live, we want to reach the most people live and engage the most people live. And I think we sort of we sort of saw that in real time. We we had a, a documentary when uh, for Tiger Woods's birthday on December 30th this past year. It was basically an hour. I think it was 50 minutes. It was it was pretty long, in which we had or it was it was live to tape. We had we had recorded it in the studio, and we had in between studio segments, we had highlights from all of his USGA Championship victories over the years. And it took, I think it took about 15 minutes for Facebook to approve the boost. So now we're halfway into the show already. The show ends and we have a couple thousand dollars left to spend. So it, we continue to spend and we continue to reach people and we continue to get views. And so when we're reporting the management saying, hey, we had 350,000 views, that sounds great. But then the, you know, this is a 50 minute product and it was the average view time is eight or nine seconds. Not only are people only seeing eight or nine seconds, they're seeing the first eight or nine seconds mm -hmm. of your product. So we really determined after that experience that if we have a certain amount of money to put toward a live broadcast, we want to make sure we're spending it during that live, during that live window. Um, and one thing we noticed, you get some really violent spikes in uh, in concurrent viewership. It'll it'll shoot straight up because I guess it serves it all at once, and then it'll kind of drop, and then it'll go back up. So we've noticed that it's it's a little inconsistent as far as keeping that audience stable. But a lot of the reason for that is you're serving it to people who weren't necessarily expecting to see your 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 content. But I I definitely think it was a good move, and it was something I would recommend if you're really trying to get people to watch your program live, rather than just padding stats later on. Just uh, to piggyback off that, uh, in the Facebook keynote yesterday morning, uh, Aaron Connolly mentioned that live videos see six times more reactions than regular videos posted. Uh, do you see more interactions with, and, and would that be one of the reasons why you would opt for the accelerated boost? Um, and anecdotally, I, I haven't seen As a- As opposed to letting yeah. the boost play out over time, like right. how, how, how your dollars are spent it, it, with that engagement. So engagement's definitely a big one, and, and and Rob, obviously the project that we worked on, it was it, you know the, the live show was all about getting people to ask questions. So you know that's certainly a big a big um, an objective for us. Uh, you know, obviously wanting people to engage as much as possible while we're live, but I think you also just you you want people to not only see your content while you're live, but you also you want people to see everything throughout the duration of your of your content. So, you know, if you're boosting it after the fact and people are seeing you after the fact, they're probably not getting into the into the content in the show the way that you want them to. And I think we're okay with, hey, someone only saw us for 30 seconds, but they saw the middle 30 seconds. You know, it's a 40 minute it's a 40 minute um, show. We want people to see all of it. We want at different times of the show whereas if it's in your timeline for hours on end, most people probably aren't digging into your content the way you want them to. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure if you heard in the keynote or otherwise about the new announcement for uh, Facebook um, uh, watch parties and Facebook uh, premieres. Uh, do you have any initial reactions or excitement or thoughts on how you might use that in your respective spaces? I personally love it. Um, I consider myself first and foremost a filmmaker, and my long-term goal with Urbanist is to make two-hour documentaries. And I think to be able to post a two-hour documentary on Facebook and have a bunch of people tune in as if it were live and they call chat about it, I think that's super exciting. It makes it, it makes, it's replicating the theater slash TV experience on an uh, online platform. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for awesome things to happen from that. Yeah, I, I like the idea. I haven't heard too much about it, but I, I really like the concept because, you know, in my space, um, in, in the sports world, so much of the sports experience now happens by using Twitter or Facebook in front of you as you watch a game. Or this happens with a Game of Thrones or an episode of uh, the Emmys or, you know, things that happen, in the communal experience of being able to react with other people through comments, tweets, things like this as it's happening is a huge part of the experience now. So I think Facebook's probably trying to tap into that. Twitter's become a, a way to feel like you're watching a game at a sports bar because everybody's talking about this game constantly. 
Um, and that happens with TV shows, obviously, as I mentioned as well. So I, I think it's cool in creating content for moments like that, knowing that people are consuming it together and responding together, I think can only be a cool modern way to be digesting that type of content. And, and I think you know what Facebook is doing, and watch parties being a great example, but then also just Facebook watch in general, they're giving people a place where it's, or brands, where it's okay to produce long form content. I mean, mm -hmm. we talk about the biggest challenge we have when we produce a really great five or six or seven minute piece. Yeah, we're pushing it out to our fans, but you're, you're reaching people who are not prepared to sit there and watch something for several minutes or longer. So I think, I think that entire community that they're sort of building is really going to be helpful down the line because people will know, okay, let's see what's new with this brand. Let's see what episode they've put out. I'm prepared to sit there for 20 minutes and watch your item and watch, watch your content rather than just giving people empty statistics of how many views when in reality nobody really consumed the content the way it was designed to be um, consumed. So I, I, really, I really like what Facebook's doing in that space. I, to your point about Facebook Watch, I also like the idea that they announced that live can deliver into a watch channel, mm -hmm. right? So now you're almost double dipping on a video platform right. for them. So I don't just have to go to live and trust that my audience is gonna be there. Anybody who's subscribed to my channel on Facebook Watch can now get the updates, oh, new episode, or they are live. So now I've double dipped on my potential reach on that. That's great. What about groups? Are any of you utilizing groups in any way? Ariel, maybe? It seems like yeah. a natural fit for you. It's, my, it's one of my biggest uh, pathways for distribution. So I focus on sharing to groups while I'm live. Either I do it my, with, uh, on myself, where I share with five or six groups while I'm live in the first two or three minutes of the live video, and then I just get a massive boost in audience size. Or I coordinate with someone else to do that for me. But yeah, groups is a huge, huge benefit because not only am I limited to my audience, now I can have access to these massive audiences that love New York City or love London or love any other specific thing. For example, I've had massive success when talking about um, musicians. So uh, I did various broadcasts on the Beatles. And Beatles fandom is massive on the Facebook groups. So you, I was able to get a huge audience. I had over 80,000 people tune in because it spread through the Beatles Facebook groups. Uh, and I think you can utilize Facebook groups in order to decide which type of content you want to create. So if you have some uh, flexibility to create different types of content, you can maybe search moms like and find like cool like awesome <laughs> groups about moms and parenting or dogs or stuff like that sure. yeah yeah we we have not utilized them at this point but it's been a, a pretty heavy conversation for us in, in recent months for a couple of a couple of reasons strategically but the smallest not being you know, we i talked about at the beginning these smaller championships they appeal to a, a smaller audience but it, very passionate fans you're talking about at our amateur championships obviously the parents of competitors but teammates you know at the college level people from the state and regional golf communities so there, there's an audience there and you know that would be a much more intimate way for us to reach that audience and so that's that's definitely something we've talked about and I wouldn't be surprised if within the next several months that was a path we went down because I think, it, like, like you said, you're finding that audience that really is interested in that content that you're producing and uh, it'll be valuable for us. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, talk to us about you know, all the problems we're having. Um, well, thank you guys for joining us as well and uh, we will give you guys a few minutes back. How about that? Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you all.